our next presenter um, is Luca Damasco, who makes things that help people make things. He develops digital tools for artists, students, and teachers while working as an educator and creative technologist. In his creative technology roles, he's worked for Riot Games as a technical artist, contributed to the Processing Foundation's Python Mode project. He created Pi5.js, a new project which allows P5.js style programming in Python in the browser. And he runs wikeditor.com, a free open source animation and game creation tool. Luca currently teaches creative coding at New York University's Integrated Digital Media Program and previously taught interactivity at Carnegie Mellon School of Art. I'm also really, really proud to say he's an alum of our Bachelor of Computer Science and Art Program at Carnegie Mellon. Luca Damasco. Thanks so much, Golan. Uh, hi, everybody. Let me get my screen share going. Get this going. All right. And. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Luca. I'm a software engineer, educator, digital toolmaker. Uh, as Golan mentioned, I uh, love making things that help people make things. And uh, I'm an alum of Carnegie Mellon University. I was in the computer science and art program. Um, also graduated uh, from the uh, HCI, Human Computer Interaction Program. Uh, and throughout my time at uh, CMU, and I actually threw these slides in after um, hearing Cassie talk about like the contributors conference and things, um, I kind of uh, f think of myself as having grown up uh, in the open source uh, creative tools and the Austa space. Um, uh, this is in 2015. Um, this is when I was a sophomore at CMU. We had the P5JS Contributors Conference. I'm there's a much less bearded version of me up there in the corner um, giving the P5JS ha hand gang sign. I think it's it, it, that was a it was a really fun conference and was kind of my first full introduction to the world of open source software tools for the arts. And um, this is actually from the 2019 uh, Contributors Conference, Cassie on the left-hand side there uh, and I were working on some uh, uh, P5 editor works. That was kind of a, a cool thing and great to see um, uh, Cassie kind of recap a bunch of stuff from the project. And so right now uh, I help run a project called Wick Editor. It's a free and open source tool for creating animations, games, and everything in between. Um, and I'll, we'll get to like what those kind of things are in a second. But today I really want to talk about, you know, how we built Wick Editor to grow with the users that were using the tool and some things that I wish I knew when, um, when we started. Uh, and I think it's super useful and super valuable to hear from other creative tool makers um, about their processes. And, and, and about the different kind of problems and struggles and uh, takeaways that they had from creating their tools. So hopefully um, to any uh, young creators over at CMU or throughout the world that are you know, making uh, their, their tools, hopefully this can give you a couple of, uh, a couple of helpful tips. So I'm gonna be talking about like what the Wick Editor actually is, you know, what people have made with it, how does it work and uh, some key factors that, were, that we thought about as we were building. And then uh, some of the major takeaways from developing the editor from, you know, how the editor evolved over time and, you know, uh, different kind of big uh, uh, things that I, I wish I had, you know, known from day one. And so let's start with just looking at like what some people have made with the Wick editor uh, so we get a good idea of what it can actually do. This first uh, project is an animation by uh, Kate Chadone, um, another student at uh, CMU, and it's called Good Eggs. It's about some good eggs that just want to have a good time. Um, sentient eggs that, you know, they get up, they dance, they have a they have a grand old time. Um, it's a it's a pretty short animation. You can watch the whole thing over on WickedEditor.com. Um, now, aside from animations, uh, it can also uh, create games. So here's a game called Bunny Tunnels. This was created by a student in one of our. Um, uh, sessions that we ran. It was uh, over a couple of days at the Studio for Creative Inquiry. Lucia was nine when uh, they created this. And it's an interactive RPG game where you control a bunny that goes around tunnels and collects carrots. You avoid the different tunnel monsters. Um, and prior to having made this game, I don't believe Lucia actually ever coded before. Um, and so Wick Editor, we did some animation workshops, some interactive stuff. And so, um, you know, there's even an underwater level for this game. Uh, we were really impressed with what uh, they were able to do. And um, uh, this is kind of an example of like the, the intro beginner user that might use this tool. And in terms of the in-between, um, we've got all sorts of different types of in-between projects. This is one of the more kind of incredible ones from recent times. Uh, this one's called Pixelide by a user called uh, known as Hamza Al-Ani on our forum. Um, this is a 
pixel-based animation software that was created inside the animation game creation software Wick Editor with its own animation engine. They're doing all sorts of like incredible stuff under the hood that I didn't even think of and that we don't even have implemented in the engine that they built alongside ours. Um, and uh, it actually recently won a, uh, a small award over at Mozilla Festival this, uh, this uh, re past March. So um, you can make all sorts of different interactive projects in the tool itself. And so how does it actually work? Um, this is the Wick Editor. This is just a you know, screenshot of the interface. Um, it's got some basic drawing tools up on the top left. You've got a drawing canvas. Um, and this is super familiar for anybody that's, you know, used paint before or illustrator or any one of these other tools. But on the bottom, there is a timeline. And this is super reminiscent of tools like Flash and other video editing programs and things like that. Um, the timeline on the bottom is just what controls the, you know, time uh, based element of your works, uh, whether that be your games or your uh, animations. And it makes it because there's that timeline there, you get a really, really easy transition between this animation and game creation environment. Um, it works in the browser. So you can kind of see this is like in a little Google Chrome browser and people start by just drawing. Um, so you just draw and, you know, use your brush tools, super familiar, gets you get up and running. Um, you then can start adding more and more frames to your animations. And so here, just drawing out a little bouncing ball, you click the play button um, and you can create your little animation. Now, this is super awesome. If, if um, you know, you're a beginner uh, like Lucia, a nine-year-old, nine and you maybe haven't worked with a full featured animation software before, being able to just kind of get started and up and running is, is, is a lot of fun and it's exciting. It makes the room kind of, you know, really excited to just be there. Um, then after you've made your animations, you can start adding some interactivity here. You know, I'm just drawing a button and you can type in a little bit of code and a little custom scripting editor that we have. And you can turn this little drawn play button with a little bit more code into an interactive button. So with you know 10 characters, um, in a few seconds, we can go from having never made something to having made an animation, to having made an interactive project. Um, and so this hopefully gives a good idea of just kind of the breadth of what you're able to do in the tool. Um, but it, while we were developing, we, we kind of massage these core ideals of the software um, uh, over time. And the first one, and this was from day one, uh, that we knew was we wanted the software to be free. Um, and the reason, I mean, it's it, you know, so simple, we're all talking about, you know, uh, uh, open source software tools for the arts. So, you know, everything we're talking about is, you know, is free to the user. But the concept of an open source animation tool really came from the idea that like, all these other tools that we loved, like, Adobe Animate um, or Flash, uh, and uh, you know these other like bigger game creation tools like you know Unity or you know Unreal Engine or whatever. These big tools usually have restrictive licenses. Uh, when the company deems them non profitable anymore, they just die. Um, or when browser standards change, they go away forever. Um, and so, trying to build this in a way that um, it, if we weren't able to completely maintain the project or um, if we weren't able to um, continue it, maybe someone could pick up our, our, our interface or work with us to actually maintain it and support the project over time. It was really important because if you're using a tool and it just kind of dies out of nowhere, that's terrible for you as a, as a creator, no matter what stage of uh, your career you're at. Um, we also wanted to uh, make it as easy as possible to access. Um, and so it's web-based, that helps a lot. Um, you know, Cassie mentioned earlier, the um, if you're trying to use this in like a school environment or a place where like downloading is prohibitive, um, you know, having a web-based tool just lets someone go to the website, click a button and they're there. So that's super useful, super easy. You don't have to get IT involved to get something on your computer. It's, it makes it so much more accessible. Um, it needs to work on inexpensive devices. So, you know, just because something is free or open source doesn't mean that um, it's, you know, designed for all sorts of stuff. So uh, an animation tool or game creation tool can be super, super intense on your computer. And so we had to make this work for Chromebooks, like $100 laptops that are in, um, you know, schools that might not have great funding. And so that was a huge core ideal of the, of the project from the beginning. Um, and then as we kept working, we had this real inclination and, and desire to make sure that the tool continued to grow with users as they used it. Basically, we wanted them to come for the ease of use as beginners and then stay for the features. And that presents all sorts of, of 
kind of difficult challenges when you're working on such a limited team building Wick Editor, I built it with my, myself and Zach Rispoli, a friend of mine, we, you know, we started it um, at CMU as a class project. And so we have very limited resources in terms of what we're able to actually put into the project. Um, we need to build all these features. We need to get them into the tool and we need to make them easy enough that a beginner that's never used them before can use them. Um, and we need to then hide some more features. It's very, it, it gets kind of complicated. And so how can we make the tool you know, ease someone from a beginner to an intermediate stage um, as a, a creator. And so this leads to kind of an overarching theme, which is like designed for beginners without sacrificing functionality. Um, and uh, that concept, you know, leads into these next big takeaways from the development process. And so where did, um, you know, we start where did the project, you know, where is it now? Um, and what would I have loved to learn while I was building my software tool, you know, back uh, in 2016 when we started? Um, now, the editor has gone through five major redesigns over time. I'm so grateful um, to uh, the Frank Ratchie Fund for Art at the Frontier, which helped support um, uh, you know, several of the changes we made uh, when we were undergrads at the studio, um, as well as the Mozilla Open Source Support Program, which you know, helped us get our most recent release up and away. Um, but throughout that time, we had to keep those core ideals and these other kind of major pieces of functionality in mind and continually redesign. Um, and so here are some big takeaways that I hope you can use as an, you know, open source software tool developer, um, or a creative or a, you know, an artist, maybe this, you know, goes into your new media practice in some way. Um, yeah, let's see. First thing, go for the absolute minimum, just build the thing. Um, early on in that first week when we made our, um, uh, first version of this tool, we started it. Uh, as just like a basic HTML page. This was like, this was version one of Wake Editor. Um, and, you know, it had the basic features, uh, things like, you know, a basic timeline. You could control the timeline by just clicking these like right and left arrow buttons. Um, you could drag in images. So we didn't even have drawing tools yet um, in this first version. Um, you know, we were really focused on the interaction. So we had like a prototype of the interactive um, uh, sequence here. So this was, super important to just kind of have this in front of us. And um, oftentimes throughout the development process, we didn't stick to this build the absolute minimum mentality. And that led us down so many rabbit holes and made us waste so much time. Whereas if we had just stuck to this kind of, you know, fundamental aspect of what was so great about our first version, we would have saved so much time and, and, and be able to use our resources as effectively as possible. Um, so yeah, go for, go for the minimum uh, in both your features and your tools and don't worry if it's not perfect. Um, next thing, uh, build community and get feedback as you go. Um, so a little uh, under a year into the, into the first version, we put out a forum. Um, this forum started um, you know, just out of kind of a need to get feedback from our community, um, eventually grew into a place where people could volunteer to actually give us support, um, where people could volunteer new critiques and criticisms and, and uh, fantastic elements of feedback. Um, but when building the community, it doesn't just happen. You don't just get a community that is um, positive and, and engaging. And so we try to figure out, you know, uh, how do we make sure this doesn't become a, a negative space from the get-go? Uh, and we looked towards other projects um, uh, that, you know, we loved and cherished. And so we got a lot of inspiration from the processing and the P5JS community. Uh, we looked at the community statement. We modeled how we would respond to questions based on how the, you know, people in GitHub issues through the, on the processing uh, repos would respond. Um, and so really focusing on that idea of like no code snobs, right? Making sure that if someone maybe responded in not so nice of a way on our forum, we didn't, you know, necessarily berate them or get angry at them. We just kind of explained like, hey, that's not how we do things here and built that community so that we could get as good feedback as possible. And this, you know, came back to us, you know, tenfold. Um, we would get responses from power users that would send us really detailed feedback. Um, this user Cryptot was fundamental in some of the earlier releases where they'd come in and, and spit out 
20 pages of feedback after a new release um, and help fix bugs and things like that. And, and there are so many folks like this on the forum. I don't just want to uh, single single them out and 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 kind of miss everybody else. But there's just so much great feedback you get when you have a place your community can live. It doesn't have to be on a forum. It could be on a Discord. It could be on an email chain. It could be on a, a, a text call uh, or, or, or a text chain for um, all you know, depending on who you're building for. Um, but just make sure that you're you've got some way to get you know connect with them. Now you're getting all this feedback. You're you've got to figure out a way to refine that feedback in some way. And so uh, you got to know who you're building for. Um, and this is something that evolves, this evolves with projects and it evolved with Wick Editor over time as well. Um, in our case, you know, we had this idea that we'd have like the complete beginner and I've got a kid on the screen here, but like we were thinking, you know, someone that's never made an animation before or barely used creative tools before, like, could we build our thing for them? Right. Um, and, uh, the intermediate user, right? So we had the intermediate user from a couple of perspectives, the idea that the beginner gets good at some point, they get confident in their own skills and they become an intermediate user. Um, and also someone might come in with previous skills and we want them to be you know, accepted into our community and, and, and be able to engage with our users and help each other grow together. So we wanna make sure we have them in mind while we're looking at this feedback. Um, and we also had students and educators. So we had a lot of really, really good um, outcomes when we would go to schools and maybe run a session or we get emails from teachers saying, hey, I found your tool. This worked perfect in my class. Um, and, you know, with no small thanks in part to the fact that we were building this for a web based system. Um, you know, these three kind of core groups helped us understand which pieces of feedback to really um, you know, consider the results of as most important, right? So by focusing these target groups, we knew how to gauge our feedback. Um, we could refine feedback that looked like this. And anybody who's made an open source project before that's gotten any traction has gotten, you know, like angry things. This is one of the nicer kind of like, <laughs> kind of like angry comments in terms of like, this tool needs animation curves or it's useless. Um, and while you might look at this and as a more experienced user, you might say, yeah, you know, without animation curves and, and, and different, um, tweening levels, this, this isn't really that helpful. But then you think back and say, well, that interface might be too complex for a complete beginner and it might actually make them not know how to use the tool. And so it lets you really refine these ideas that come back to you um, and uh, you know, put things on the back burner that are um, valuable. And maybe at some point we'll be able to get to them for our more advanced folks, but um, uh, it lets you know what's most useful right now. Um, You've also got to be able to like uh, get responses from your community, right? And, and knowing um, who those major target groups are lets you do things like ask really targeted questions. Something like, you know, what was the per worst part about making your animation or making your game? Um, and being able to ask that on your forum and know like wh who's going to be responding and like what kind of, um, uh, you know, feedback you might get. Um, that's, you know, a really, really good way to get responses. And then you've also got to know how to like interpret your feedback. Um, so refining the feedback, getting the feedback, interpreting it. And um, this isn't too hard in terms of like online discussion, but when you're in a classroom and you've got like a young kid and they say something like, do you have any purple? Um, you've got to know, okay, this, this is a you know, five-year-old, I'm making an animation with them. Um, and uh, you know, they're asking me if I have any purple. What's the metaphor here? Oh, they can't find the color picker. Uh, this means that like there's a fundamental, probably a fundamental issue with like the way I've put the, the color picker on the screen, or maybe it's too complex. Maybe I don't, instead of getting like a color wheel, maybe I should make this into um, something simpler. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, figure out how to interpret your feedback. Knowing your target groups lets you um, interpret that a little simpler. And then lastly, having you know, these different community groups and things lets you find artifacts from your community and use those as uh, measures of the community's success. And so in our case, we would do things like search on YouTube for the, for the term Wick Editor. And if people were um, uh, you know, interested enough in the tool itself to put Wic Editor in their description or in the title of their project, that was like, a huge success for us. So we've got, you know, kids that might be in middle school, high school using this tool. And they're like, I made this in Wick Editor and they're happy and proud to display that. That's a great artifact to find and a great kind of story to tell to let you know, hey, are we doing the right thing for our community and for the people that are using this tool? Um, and uh, this one's 
this next kind of big takeaway uh, is a little harder in times of COVID, um, obviously, but get on site if you can. Um, if you're building for other people, work with those people directly. Um, and it, this one might seem like it's kind of, you know, it goes without saying, but um, you start to find problems that you never would have experienced when you're building stuff on your fancy dev machine, like a MacBook. Um, you start to do things like, like this. So this is our, you know, I think, fourth release, um, fourth major release is, is what's on the screen here. Um, and this was our first release where we changed the colors of the editor. And um, you might look at this and be like, okay, dark mode, it was a trend, right? All of my software that I'm using changed to, to be dark mode like in the last couple of years. We changed this not because we thought it was like a cool thing. We changed this because it was an accessibility issue. We would go into classrooms and they would have these like really inexpensive computers that would cost a hundred bucks. Um, and because our interface was so light, um, people couldn't see students that might have had, um, you know, an, an individualized education plan or, or some kind of like, you know, impairment or something like that. It was really hard for them to actually utilize our tool in the current contrast state that it was in. And so that informed um, how we would improve it. If we hadn't gone on site and seen them in their situations and tried to work with them directly, um, we would never have found many of these problems as fast as we did. Um, we also wouldn't have thought of some of our kind of like, um, uh, kind of like expert fog, right? Like because we're more advanced users, um, the uh, we would add in things like drop down menus and think these were fine. We would do things like right click menus that were you know pretty um, dense. Uh, and if we hadn't gone into classrooms and just seen that students completely ignored these and beginners completely ignored these, um, we would never have come to solutions like this one. And so in the most recent version of WIC, there's a really, really big green play button. Um, every major function um, that a beginner or an early intermediate user might need is just a one-click button away. You don't even have to go into a menu to use it. So in this case, we've got a play button and then from, um, uh, the button right next to the play button is the recenter button. So if someone drags their canvas too far away or they zoom in too far, um, they can click recenter and come back home and, and you know, we put their canvas right in the middle of their screen. These kinds of things, you, you won't realize that they're like features you really need or um, interface changes you might need unless you're on site. And this goes for so many different types of interactive experiences. Um, if you're not in the situation, you don't really know um, what kind of problems will come up. And um, another big thing that we continued to kind of use as we kept redesigning and redesigning, you know, five major redesigns in, in, in five years is, is quite a, quite a few, um, is we started doing this concept of designing for redesignability. Uh, and um, this is like making sure the product's approachable without re sacrificing this redesignable concept. Uh, and what that means is we're just two people that are making this tool and with a few, you know, maybe a designer here and there that would jump in, um, you know, our team would never grow beyond five people at any time, um, the core, the core developers. Um, and so we would need to deal with problems like this one where we'd have like our timeline, um, which was uh, a core element of like the animation and interaction um, of the project uh, would start to get really cluttered. And so we'd have a few buttons and then we'd have to add some more features and then a few more buttons would show up. And eventually, because this project wasn't really, this, this part of the tool wasn't really redesignable, we didn't, we didn't know how to add in new features or what we could remove, we kind of got lost. And so this would eventually evolve into interfaces that look like this, where um, we would have a couple of buttons, uh, a couple of really core features. We'd really narrow down what was super useful and we'd leave gaps and, and pieces of empty space in the interface um, where we said, maybe there's a feature we wanna add here in the future. Um, we'd also add in some like artificial restrictions. So like here we could probably only have five buttons if you're looking from there's like that diamond button next to the red playhead. And then there's a little frame button next to that and a, you know, a trash can next to that. We said, you know, we wouldn't want to have more than five things here. So we only left enough space for about five things. Um, and we were thinking, how can we redesign this without kind of going overboard in the future? Um, so yeah, redesignability, really, really valuable when you're on just like a small core open source team. Um, 
And then last biggest takeaway here is the concept of embracing external resources um, and like learning to like ask questions and not do it all yourself if you can help it. Um, you know, before you, you build a feature, try to ask like, has someone else done this? There were so many times we were just like, writing a bunch of code for our tool um and it was it was a pain <laughs> and and we then realized three months later that someone had made a library and they had made their library open source um and it was what we were looking for originally um and having an open source tool utilize the other open source resources just saves you time it lets your projects collaborate in some way you as a um as a user can then contribute back to them with feedback or monetary funding if you're able to do it these things are super, super helpful. Um, you know, next thing is like before, like overextending yourself, like ask who you can reach out to. If you've got that community building up, or if you've got, you know, uh, folks around you that are developers, or if you've got other folks that you can ask questions to, like see who you can reach out to at, at the very least for advice or suggestions. Um, and don't feel like you have to do it in a bubble. Um, many times throughout the development of WIC, um, I, you know, we would kind of silo ourselves a little bit too much and not ask for help in certain places. And so that was you know, a, a big problem throughout that, throughout that process. And um, is a, I, I'm sure a big problem for so many other open source tool developers. Um, and the uh, last kind of main, main thing here is like, before you can't afford your server, um, ask, how can we fund this? Um, and uh, you know, there's un unfortunately like this um, hardcore mentality um, for a lot of open source developers where they try to completely separate um, any type of like monetary funding from the work that they're doing. And if they can, and if you can afford that, and if you're in a position where that, you know, that's okay for you, that's fine. Um, but funding in, in the, in the form of, um, you know, community contributions to something like a Patreon or an open collective page, or like a, um, you know, some way you can kind of crowdfund those resources, um, or funding in the, uh, you know, from a grantor, like, you know, if you're a, a student at a university that might give you a grant, that's great. If you're, um, an open source developer and you can maybe find a, a, another, um, uh, organization that might be able to give you a grant, um, uh, or if you can, you know, if on the flip side of this, if you're an organization that can fund a, an open source project, you should, you should be doing that, um, especially if you're using it in your own pipelines. Um, that funding question shouldn't be a, um, a, a, a taboo thing to ask because you know funding means time it means um, the ability to pay your to pay your staff and, and designers and contributors and that's super super valuable for the project for the communities that they that they're a part of um, ask the question uh, and then you know I added this slide in after hearing Cassie say it but just to emphasize contribute and support your open source tools that you're using um, if you are from an organization using an open source uh, software tool um, or an individual that has the, the ability to um, send a, a donation or a support um, to those organizations that that support gets used a million fold over um, as Colon was saying so make sure that, uh, that that you're contributing and supporting to these tools in any way you can um, and uh, yeah, that's that's it for my talk. I'm Luca. Uh, if you want to check out Wick Editor, it's on wickeditor.com. And hopefully um, these takeaways are helpful for you in your creative tool and new media journeys. Luca, thank you so much. Uh, we got time for just maybe one quick question. So I wanted to pull it from uh, the YouTube chat. Um, how do you get the first members of your community? Um, you know, what's what's a good way to share your project in the very beginning? Project yeah. in this case, meaning your open source tool. Uh, to get that that sort of vibrant community, and I I, I can think of some ways that I, I observed you doing it. Let's hear you talk about. It. Yeah, that's a fantastic question because uh, it's not and it's not an immediately easy one, right? Um, so the first thing I would I would say is like ask yourself like who you think would find it valuable, um, and really define for you like what kind of a project are you trying to build? Is this a tool for you? Is this a tool for a specific group of people? Like I said, in our case, we had students, we had beginners, things like that. Once you identify those groups, try to expand. We were like, okay, beginners, we could go to a school. We can go to an after school program. So we worked with like a nonprofit after school assemble in Pittsburgh. And we would, we just said, hey, can we come by and run an animation workshop for an hour? And they were totally fine with that. And they, they loved that. So there's so many organizations where you can start building out these initial kind of like testers. And from there, they like your community starts to build. Um, in, in one of the previous, uh or a couple of the previous Austin lectures, I think it was on Tuesday night, we saw that people had made a mini residency within their mini residency. Uh, AM had made a residency within within their project, uh, and then Valencia had made a, uh, 
uh, residency within hers. And I remember that, that one of the things you've done is you, you sort of, you had like little mini competitions where you sort of, yeah. uh, you, you, you know, elicited people to make demos, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And we, so we would, you know, um, we were fortunate enough through the Fan Crashy Fund for Art at the Frontier um, at the studio. We got a, a micro, uh, I think it was a, not a micro grant, but it was, a, it was, it was a couple thousand dollars, which was super valuable for us at the time. We took that money, we broke it up into like smaller amounts of, of money to do things like a small competition um, where folks could like make an animation that gave us feedback and initial users. We also had like uh, fantastic student artists and designers and we had them like good eggs, the animation I showed at the beginning of the talk that was funded by a FurFef grant. So like th these are fantastic ways of getting new people in.